раз. Uh, dear colleagues, let's start. My name is Andrei Bogdanov. From, I'm from Yofa Institute. I'm very pleased to open this session devoted to the metal nanostructures. And our first speaker is Igor Malirov from Cardiff University. And his talk is devoted to the uh, resonance state expansion for the dispersive optical system. Okay, welcome. Okay, now it's switched on. Um, after giving a brief introduction on resonant states and describing the key principle of the resonant state expansion, which is a new method uh, in electrodynamics, I will give some three-dimensional examples and comparison with uh, commercial solvers. And then this will bring me to the main part of my talk where I include the dispersion of the frequency dispersion of the permittivity uh, which is typical necessary for nanoplasmonics into the R resonance state expansion into the RC and describe and this show you how, how this works. Um, so to uh, see what the resonance, what the resonance states are, it, is, it, can, it can be useful, it's simple to look at the transmission of a, uh, some observers like transmission of a uh, optical system for example, the planar microcavity, familiar to all of you. Uh, as you know, there is a narrow peak in the transmission, which, is, which refers to the, um, uh, to the cavity mode, uh, which is at the center of the stop band. And if we, we imagine that we can uh, um, extend, uh, this is a frequency, if we, real frequency, observable um, if we extend uh, uh, this function into the complex frequency plane uh, all these features in the transmission spectrum will be described by a set of um, poles of this function t of omega uh, and these poles are at the positions of the complex frequencies of resonance states with the quality factor given by the ratio of the real and imaginary part. So this plot is, is a complex plane plot this with the imaginary part of omega, real part of omega. So there will we see uh, many of such plots in this talk. Now, uh, formally, resonance states are, are defined as eigen solutions of Maxwell's equations. We are talking about electrodynamics here with outgoing wave boundary conditions. And in the very simple case of a dielectric slab, we have, uh, with such a trivial transmission spectrum, we have a set of equidistant resonances having uh, the same imaginary part. And to look into the wave function, we can concentrate on one of them. These are all fabry pro modes. And if we take the fabry pro mode number 10 and create an excitation at an initial point in, the, in, the, in our system and allow it to evolve, uh, then we see that uh, the energy uh, leaks out of the system, the amplitude decreases in time, and uh, at the same time, it grows exponentially 
into uh, to the outside, uh, which uh, makes actually a big problem in its normalization. So you can't normalize in the usual way by integrating the square modulus or the square, but instead you need for the proper normalization to take into account uh, an additional surface term. So this normalization consists of two terms, volume and the surface term, and made over a finite volume, arbitrary volume outside, uh, including the system, so that all divergences or radial dependence of this integral are fully compensated by the surface term. And this normalization is actually linked to the Green's function, or if you like the transmission. As I said, transmission has a pulse. Green's function is similar to transmission or similar to scattering matrix, whatever you like. And this is standard spectral representation of the Green's function in spectral, known in spectral theory with a set of simple poles, actually infinite set. A classical damped harmonic oscillator has only two poles, if you know that, in the Green's function. And this is a physical, physical system, quantum if you, if you like, although this is an electrodynamical system, and it has an infinite number of poles. And this, this expression determines the normalization, actually. For uh, dispersive systems, we need to include the dispersion. This has to be generalized to include the dispersion of epsilon, standing here as a weight function. Now we have a derivative with respect to the frequency. And the surface term doesn't change, actually, but it is written here in a more general form, not uh, related to, the, to any specific uh, coordinate system or any uh, specific surface. So su surface can be any. Uh, and this is the volume surrounded by this surface. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, draw your attention to these derivatives, which is, looks complicated, but we need the derivatives because uh, the normalization takes properly into account the um, direction of the uh, local uh, wave, uh, local electromagnetic field the, of the propagating electromagnetic field, and for that you need to differentiate it. Now, uh, what the resonance state expansion is. So it's a rigorous method of calculating these resonance states, resonances, in a, an arbitrary open optical system described by, a, by some function of permittivity, by some permittivity. And it works in the following way. So you need to split your, the, this arbitrary permittivity into a part which is, has been treated. For example, it can be analytically uh, known or it can be solved by some other means, and the perturbation with respect to this uh, unperturbed one. The unperturbed satisfies some Maxwell's equation, uh, and for the perturbation, we de determine a perturbation matrix with the resonance states of the unperturbed system standing here, and the, the RC is a, actually brings the, this complicated Maxwell equation to a linear uh, matrix eigenvalue problem, which is straightforward. So it's just diagonalization of a matrix. Uh, the key elements the Terrazon state expansion is based on are the Green's function uh, spectral representation, which I have already shown, the well-known Dyson's equation with Green's function of the unperturbed system standing here and the perturbation, and the completeness of resonance states which allows us to expand the perturbed field into the unperturbed one. So if we now plug these expansions into Dyson's equation here, here, and Green's function here, we will get this equation with obviously our matrix elements because we have integration here d defined like this, and equating coefficients at the same basic functions, we finally arrive at this linear matrix uh, uh, eigenvalue problem I showed you already. Now, this is still without dispersion, so I want to proceed step by step. So now we take some illustration, and this is a simple uh, dielectric, ideal dielectric sphere, the glass bead in vacuum, which already has a non-trivial spectrum. First of all, it's by, symmet by symmetry there is a, um, a different uh, 
modes with different L orbital momentum L do not speak to each other. We can consider uh, uh, each L separately. And each mode has uh, uh, two L plus one degeneracy due to the magnetic quantum number. Uh, the spectrum consists of three types of modes. This is, again, real part of frequency, the imaginary part of frequency with some part of in log scale. Here, it consists of leaky modes, Fabry pair modes, and famous wave guy, uh, whisper gallery modes. Uh, and uh, these circles are uh, the modes of the unperturbed system, the glass beer with the track thing is 1.5. And uh, we take a perturbation of this epsilon 5, so it's shown here, and get a, another spectrum with these crosses here, and a, more whispering gallery modes, which were not present in the unperturbed space. Boxes are the exact solution we, it, which is available for the system, and you can compare how good the RC is. So the, the, the accuracy is very high, and it depends on the number of states, actually. You truncate somewhere at large frequency, and this is the number of states you've taken into account. So the larger you, if you increase it by a factor of two, you get one order of magnitude better accuracy. This is the relative error of scales like one over n cubed. And this is not limited to small perturbation, so you can consider even larger perturbation with changing epsilon by a factor of five more than before, and you have a quite similar accuracy, a little bit less than that, but this can be uh, compensated by taking more states. And finally, this is for this illustration, to complete this illustration for dielectrics, a very non-trivial example where there's no symmetry, uh, uh, and all uh, L and M modes, all modes mixed, are mixed up by the perturbation. So we have a sphere, dielectric sphere, with a perturbation of a quarter sphere uh, of delta epsilon one. And we uh, see the circles, unperturbed modes, uh, TE, TM, and different L, one, two, three. And if we concentrate on L7, here we expect uh, it is this unperturbed mode is 12 plus one, means 15 times degenerate, and this the perturbation splits the degeneracy, producing these 15 modes, crosses of the, the RC, which there's no exact solution to compare with, but we can use some commercial software like uh, Comsol, with f using finite element methods to, uh, math uh, finite element method to um, compare with, using different uh, mesh size, and increasing the, uh, number of elements, we approach asymptotically some value which is close to the, to the IRC, but not quite. So the, if, we go, if we look at the relative error, we see that uh, the COMSOL is uh, uh, saturated at the error of 10 to the minus three around that, and the similar gives the finite uh, difference in the time domain, uh, which is numerical, for instance, while the IRC uh, goes down and the accuracy is unlimited. And also, this is a computational time, or this, the basis size, or the mesh size. Uh, if we uh, concentrate on the accuracy, of the maximum accuracy of COMSOL, for instance, we see that the RC is three, three orders of magnitude faster, which is amazing. Now, this was dialectics. Now, we, I, have, I want to include the, uh, the dispersion so in order to treat uh, plasmonic uh, nanoparticles. Uh, the general dispersion or, of, uh, of, the, of the permittivity can be expressed uh, as a, a series, uh, uh, su such as superposition of Lorentz poles. This is a, a strict result, this is a theorem. So if you have unlimited number of, of these things, you can do this. Uh, but of course, in reality, you limit to some a few terms in order to describe the, the measured permittivity. So the famous uh, situation, uh, special cases of this as a, first of all, Ohm's law. This is generalized permittivity, but or generalized uh, conductivity, and this will be just the conductivity, uh, uh, the normal conductivity in case of the first term is uh, in case of uh, uh, pole, at, pole at zero frequency. Then if you add uh, another term, uh, you will get uh, through, uh, through the model, also very, 
well known. And then taking more and more terms, we, we will get so-called Drew de Lorentz model. Uh, for instance, this is the uh, Johnson Christie data, quite well known for gold, uh, for the uh, uh, real imaginary part of the refractive index approximated by uh, Drew de model and by uh, Drew de Lorentz model with two pairs of Lorentz poles. Lorentz poles come in pairs due to the um, uh, causality principle. Uh, and it works quite well. These interband transitions are described really by including the uh, Lorentz poles into the model. But what happens to the RSC if we take this kind of dielectric uh, function? <coughs> uh, we have to plug into the matrix elements the dispersive uh, delta epsilon. And uh, now our uh, matrix problem becomes nonlinear, which is a nightmare. If, uh, those who have dealt with diagonalization of mat matrices or the matrix problems understand what, what the nonlinear is. Uh, so we can, of course, try to linearize it by some mathematical methods, but it's a complicated. I will come back to this later. So the, the idea is that we need to find a way how to make this linear. And this is done by looking at the closure relation, the completeness. So if we take again the Green's function spectral representation, plug it into the, uh, the, the way Maxwell's wave equation with the, for the Green's function with the delta like so, delta so storm term and use Maxwell's equation, we uh, obtain the closure relation which is such an awful uh, uh, factor which depends on frequency and this has to be satisfied for any frequency. So that uh, to understand it better, so we can consider a similar thing for non-dispersive uh, system. And in this case, we'll, we'll consist only of two terms, and which split into the no normal closure relation and the sum rule in addition to that. So which means that the system of resonance, the set of resonance states is an overcomplete set. But this overcompleteness is actually good news because it gives us uh, some flexibility. There's an additional degree of freedom to choose the form of the Green's function. Now with, this was in non dispersed again. Now if we take into account the, uh, the Lorentz uh, poles of the permittivity, each pole gives its own su additional sum rule. And this additional degree of freedom. And we define, the, uh, we re represent the same Green's function in a different form in order to compensate further the, for the Lorentz poles in the, in the RSC. So we come back to the Dyson's equation and plug in here uh, the uh, change of the permittivity containing these Lorentz poles and can split into uh, all terms according to the summation over Lorentz poles. And for each Lorentz pole, in, include the, its own representation of the Green's function with the cancellation of the Lorentz pole, so with this, with this frequency dependence. So we end up with uh, the same frequency dependence as in the non-dispersive RC. This is the result equation. You can see that frequency appears only here. And the matrix element of the uh, dispersive uh, change of the permittivity is taken on the, at the unperturbed mode unlike the uh, nonlinear dispersive RC, which I showed before, where here it is perturbed one and you have to solve a nonlinear equation. In the non-dispersive case, uh, the non-dispersive case is a special case of this more general, so it can be restored. Now, finally, uh, a couple of illustrations. Uh, so we make uh, an alchemist experiment, creating sand from gold first, so with sand means uh, um, silly, uh, a, a, a bead with a, a sphere in vacuum with a permittivity uh, as of uh, silica, 1.5, uh, the refractive unit of 1.5. And we make it, we spoil the gold, our gold sphere, make it sand out of that first. Uh, and this, uh, these circles are the spectrum of the of of gold, and it is already a non-trivial spectrum. I haven't seen this in the literature. I was surprised that 
it's not available, the full spectrum. Of course, people know about plasmonic, uh, about Fabry Pro modes, surface plasmon mode. This is now L equals one. And TM, because in TE there's no plasmon. But also each pole in the permittivity produces an infinite series of additional resonance states, which are shown here. And uh, this is an infinite series that, of course, we trans truncate in, in practice. And if, as we approach the pole in the permittivity, the wavelengths corresponding to this resonance state decreases. And of course, we want to, uh, it determines our resolution. We don't, we want to limit our resolution. Uh, and uh, we, our perturbation is that, that we switch off all conductivities and correct on the refractive index, and this is the results. Uh, we obtain these crosses, uh, which are the resonance states of, uh, of the dielectric. We're very simple with, with the leaky mode and fabric per modes only, because it's L equals one. The relative error shown here, and this looks very similar to what we, ha we had in a uh, case of non-dispersive RSE with a one over n cubed uh, convergence. And finally, uh, this is the second part of the alchemist experiment. I uh, restore Drude model for simplicity. And uh, we start with Drude model for simplicity. And uh, we start with the, uh, with the spectrum of the uh, dielectric and make uh, gold out of that. So we switch on the conductivities uh, uh, so that we had then, then we have uh, surface plasmon and uh, poles around the Drude, Drude pole. Uh, so, and this, the quality is pretty much the same. So I skip some other parts and come to the conclusion. So in this walk, we've treated our system optical systems with arbitrary dispersion of the permittivity, which is represented by, in practice, by a finite number of simple poles. And the RC itself is exact rigorous equation for arbitrary uh, permittivities, uh, and it, it introduces a natural discretization brought by, introduces a natural discretization brought by, introduces a natural discretization brought by resonance states um, and find all resonances in the desired spectral range. And finally, overall, the RC is a new tool in physics. Not only in electrodynamics, it can be applied to quantum mechanics, gravitational waves, if you like. And as I demonstrated in this talk, it's more Thank you for your attention. I think we have a time for one or two short questions, please. Time for one or two short questions, please. Uh, arbitrary basis of resonance states. Yes, we can take an arbitrary system. So, you, for instance, you calculate it by some other means, arbitrary system. So if, for instance, you calculate it by some other means, so, some, by using console or whatsoever, and use it as a basis for perturbation, yeah. True. Sure. More questions, please? Yes, please. Do you sell uh, your, uh, your approach no? in contrast <laughs> to, to commercial programs? Uh, uh, we actually try, uh, are trying to patent this thing, so we made patent uh, application of, of, the, of the dispersive RC, and uh, now we are going to make another patent application on so, about waveguides. So we so deal with some kind of uh, uh, advertisement, yeah? <laughs> uh, no, not really. Uh, so it, this is fundamental physics, actually. So, and 
uh, so commercial side is not of much interest to me, but yeah, it's, <laughs> and for us it's, it's not a big profit, to be honest, in any case. So you, the university will take, <laughs> Cardiff University in this case will take some, but probably not me. Okay, now let's thanks our speaker again. And the next speaker is Anton Chesnov. Is uh, Chesnitsky? I'm sorry. Uh, Chesnitsky is his work is uh, devoted to the uh, transverse magnet optical uh, care effect in strongly coupled plasma grating. Good day, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Anton Chesnitsky. Uh, I am glad to present our work, uh, which uh, deals with uh, light mode interaction and the uh, external magnet, which uh, deals with uh, light mode interaction and the uh, external magnet, which uh, deals with uh, light mode interaction and the uh, external magnet, which uh, deals with uh, light mode interaction and the uh, external magnetic field. And uh, uh, for the first time, magnet, magnet optical effects. Uh, was discovered uh, in the middle of the 19th, uh, 19th century. Uh, and uh, control of the light is an important uh, task of modern physics. And uh, the usage of external uh, magnetic fields is, is one of the most promising way to solve this problem. And nowadays, uh, interest to magneto optics is increasing because of uh, development of uh, matter science, uh, uh, nanotechnologies and nanophotonics. Uh, the most of the popular configuration is smoke. Uh, uh, here, uh, the intensity of reflected light is modulated by external magnetic field. A uh, magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the incidence of light. Uh, in the presence of external magnetic field, uh, the electric, uh, dielectric permittivity tensors becomes non-diagonal, and uh, non-diagonal components are proportional to the external magnetic field. Uh, moreover, these components uh, uh, depends on electric field in the structure. Uh, uh, the value of uh, magnet optical response is described by delta parameter, and typical values for bar ferromagnetics uh, achieves about uh, 10 to the minus third power. Uh, Interest to magnetoptics uh, is due to a number of practical applications. Uh, firstly, magnetoptical devices can be used, uh, such as uh, room temperature magnetic field sensors uh, or uh, label free biosensors. Uh, finally, magnetoptical effects can be used for, um, for magnonics and spin wave technologies. Uh, magnetoptical effects can. Um, rec um, Uh, it's uh, very promising for development of a new type of uh, electronic components, optical and uh, data storage. Unfortunately, uh, there are a number of uh, disadvantages. Uh, first of all, the magnetic optical effects are rather weak and they require huge external fields. Uh, so, uh, magnetic optical structures uh, usually are six structures and uh, the structures have uh, high optical losses. The most promising way to solve this problem is the com uh, combination of magneto-optics with plasmonics. Uh, and the plasmons is uh, collective excitations of free electrons in the solids. Uh, there are several types of the plasmons. Uh, uh, first type is the localized surface plasmons. It uh, exceeds uh, in the conductive nanoparticles. And the second type is uh, uh, propagating surface plasmons. It uh, propagates uh, at the interface between dielectric and metal. Uh, plasmons uh, uh, could enhance uh, electri electric field, uh, enhance and localized electric, uh, electric field. Mm. And uh, spectral positions of uh, surface plasma resonance uh, uh, is depends uh, on uh, the electric environment of the structure, uh, geometry of structure, and materials of structure. Mm. 
the wavelength of the surface plasmons uh, are much smaller than the uh, wavelength of incident light. Uh, the last five years, a lot of attention is drawn to the structure with strongly coupled plasmons. Here you can see one of the such structures. Uh, it consists of uh, uh, array of periodically nanoparticles and uh, continuous uh, metallic film uh, separated by the thin uh, dielectric buffer. Mm. So in, this, in such structure, uh, exist uh, two plasmon resonances uh, uh, and the uh, interaction between these resonances uh, produce a fennel-like asymmetry uh, resonance in the reflection spectrum. Uh, it's a resonance very sensitive to the electric environment of the structure. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, the, uh, such structure uh, will help to obtain uh, more strong uh, magnetoptical activity of the uh, magnetoptical structures. Uh, typical magneto, uh, typical plasmonic materials is the noble metals uh, such as gold, silver, and copper. Uh, but they uh, have uh, uh, low magnetoptical performance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, ferromagnetic uh, metals uh, uh, have low plasma distribution length. And uh, there are two ways to solve these problems, is uh, combining uh, noble metals and ferromagnetic metals in one structure. And second uh, way is uh, usage uh, ferromagnetic dielectric, like as bismuth iron garnets, which have uh, high magneto-optical activity and uh, uh, low losses for magneto-optics. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, different hybrid uh, magneto-optical structures. Uh, typically, they consist of uh, ferromagnetic and noble metals, and uh, we can see that uh, enhanced of magneto-optical response uh, exists uh, in the presence of uh, around plasmon resonances. Mm. And the second type of structure consists of uh, noble metals and ferromagnetic dielectrics. Uh, Professor Bilotelov, uh, with colleagues, investigates such structures. Uh, typical uh, optical response in, um, achieves about 0 0.02, uh, but many authors uh, prefer to present uh, not uh, absolute uh, or uh, relative value of the delta parameter, which can mm, uh, this can be achieved by vanishing of the denominator of this formula. And it is useless for many practical applications. Uh, there are a few works in which, um, uh, in which two plasma resonances exist in one structure, but in this work, um, their spectral position are separated and magnetic -opt optical response Mm. Uh, not enhanced uh, uh, in this structure. Uh, we designed and numerically simulated a magneto-optical structure with strongly coupled plasmons. Mm. Uh, we uh, choose the bismuth iron, ga iron garnet like uh, dielectric, ferromagnetic dielectric, and silver uh, as a plasmonic material. Uh, the dielectric, dielectric permittivity tensor of the bismuth iron garnet are presented, uh, is presented on the slide. And the uh, uh, geometry of the unit cell, uh, you can see in this picture. Uh, there are several uh, uh, in this structure, uh, you can see electric field distribution and uh, silver film uh, propagates uh, uh, surface placements, and uh, we can see uh, enhancement of uh, electric field between the gap, uh, uh, between the gap localized surface placements and uh, surface placements polaritons. Mm. Local electric field in this structure uh, can be uh, enhancement, and uh, enhancement achieves about 100 in this structure. Uh, 
spectral positions of um, <coughs> uh, this uh, structure depends on more geometrical parameters and of the uh, from the angle of the incidence of light. Mm. We optimized our structure for um, to, to obtain maxi maximum magneto-optical response of this structure. And uh, here you can see uh, uh, localized surface placements, spectral reflection, and uh, uh, surface propagating surface placements. At the angle, uh, at this angle, uh, we have such spectral with Fener resonances uh, in, in this uh, wavelength. And uh, strong coupling is induced by tailoring of the structural parameters. And in this case, uh, or adjusting the angle of the incidence field. Uh, here you can see magneto-optical uh, response of such structure. Uh, the gray line is the uh, uh, reflection spectrum of the uh, spectrum of, this of the structure. Mm. Uh, in the vicinity of final resonance, absolute value of magneto-optical response reaches. Uh, final resonance, absolute value of magneto-optical response reaches uh, 0 0.06. And, uh, it is worth to note that we use uh, uh, absolute value of delta parameter in our work. And in conclusion, uh, uh, coupling of, of uh, localized surface and surf propagating surface placement for Tmokin, uh, uh, we use a ferromagnetic dielectric for, uh, uh, we use a ferromagnetic dielectric for our structure. And it is found that in the vicinity of Fener resonances, absolute value of magneto-optical response, response uh, reached um, about 0 0.06. Uh, that is uh, two times higher than for typical values. Uh, and obtained results are promising for uh, other applications. Thank you for your attention. Questions, please? Please. What is the physical term of unity? Uh, if we have uh, small reflections uh, uh, value of the spectra, maybe, uh, for example, uh, in this uh, structure for uh, transmission, uh, extraordinary transmission, we have very small values of transmission spectra. And uh, maybe we can. <laughs> More questions, please? Maybe I've got one question, we have time. So uh, you use some plasmonic structures to increase the field and increase the optical uh, Activity, yes? yes, and but the, it's well known that plasma structures uh, has high losses. Is there any way to increase the field by keep the losses at low level? Uh, low uh, ferromagnetic metals have uh, uh, high losses. We use in such structures uh, noble metals with slow losses, and uh, ferromagnetic dielectric uh, usually have uh, uh, low losses, and. Uh, we optimized uh, the spectral of structure for mm, for uh, such uh, uh, such uh, reflection spectra. Okay, thank you. No more questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Vladimir Fedorov from Yopf Institute, and his work is devoted to the magnetic proximity effect in ferro and ferry uh, magnet, cobalt, yttrium, iron, granite, na nanohedral structures. First, I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity for, to me to make this talk. Um, and 
then. Sorry, we have, I think, a couple of minutes of delay because of some problem with the presentation. Подожди, Май. А, ну, можно быстрее еще раз, можно еще раз копировать. А, Sorry for the inconvenience, for the way. So, most part of this work uh, has been done at Yoffe Institute, at uh, Nikolai Sokolov Epitaxial Insulators Group, uh, except of uh, experiments which was done with the uh, use of synchrotron radiation they were done at two synchrotron radiation facilities at Japan, Photon Factory and Hiroshima Synchrotron Radiation Center. So, um, the motivation is of, of this work is to, uh, the ability of engineering of the ma magnetic properties of yttrium iron garnet by new method, namely the magnetic proximity effect so iron garnet is a well-known material, which is, uh, f this is ferromagnetic insulator, and due to its uh, unique properties, such a narrow ferromagnetic resonance light line width, it has uh, plenty of application in uh, such equipment, like in radio frequency application. So, um, liquid phase epitaxy films are well studied, uh, well studied, and the strain engineering by substitu substitution uh, of rare earth elements and metals in garnets are well known, but we suggest the new method to engineer these pr magnetic properties of this material. Um, Magnetic proximity effects usually refers to the phenomena which occurs at the interface between different mag magnetic phases, um, which can lead to changes of magnetic properties of materials, such as ordering temperatures, uh, anisotropy values, etc. Mm. The most well-known magnetic proximity effect is the exchange bias effect in ferromagnet anti-ferromagnet structures, uh, which results in the shift of hysteresis loop. So, goal of this study is to engineering such properties as the magnetic anisotropy or domain structure of the yttrium iron garnet, which are important for the applications by the interlayer coupling with the structures with layer of transition metal grown on top of garnet. Um, the garnet films were grown by laser molecular beam epitaxy technique, which uh, can be explained as a pulse laser deposition, which has a 
uh, high energy electron diffraction and uh, UHV chamber. Mm. So the idea of uh, laser molecule beam detoxy is a material transfer from the target by, laser, la by pulse laser ablation, which, which allows us to pre uh, control the properties of growing things by uh, control the ga gas atmosphere, choosing substrate, appropriate substrate, and grow conditions. So in this work, the two types of samples were grown. First type is a sam sample is both of layers, cobalt as well as garnet layers, were grown by uh, laser MBE. These uh, samples were studied ex situ by magneto optical care effect. And the, of course, cobalt was oxidized, oxidized top of uh, co cobalt layer was oxidized in the atmosphere, in the ambient atmosphere. And the second type of sample is uh, on already grown by laser MBE garnet layer. Uh, cobalt layer was evaporated in situ for XMCD, uh, for in situ XMCD studies at high source synchrotron radiation facility. S so this allows us to uh, not afraid of oxidation. Uh, first, I want to show you the uh, garnet films, which we can grow. So we use the gadolinium gallium garnet substrate, which is extremely well lattice matched to yttrium iron garnet. We use the 111 orientation of substrate to compensate the cubic magnetic crystalline isotropy of garnet. And before grow, we anneal this uh, substrates to get the smooth surface with surface atomic steps, uh, which allows us to grow garnet films in different regimes, such as layer by layer or step flow regimes. Uh, we can conclude it because we can see the oscillation of specular read uh, intensity, intensity of specular reflection in read patterns. You can see the time to grow one monolayer is 15 seconds in case of layer by layer mode. And in this case, we can obtain the pseudomorphic uh, garnet films with uh, atomically flat surfaces. This is the atomic force microscopy of 10 nanometers thick garnet layer. And this is the crystal truncation rods, these films. And uh, more information about these films can be found in these reference, references. So on top of this layer, we grew the cobalt. Here you can see the su surface before the cobalt deposition, and this is the surface after the deposition of cobalt. Some presence of these steps can be seen here. So, if, and if you could look in high magnification, you can see that the film is consist from small, small islands, smaller than the uh, AFM tip, and these islands are interconnected, and uh, we. Uh, we think that this is continuous film of polycrystalline cobalt. Uh, and if you look uh, magnetical pro or look for magnetic properties of these films, we use for magnet optical care effect. Thanks to previous speaker, I will not discuss in detail uh, of this method. You can see that the before the deposition of transition metal, the garnet films uh, exhibit extremely small loop width, uh, less than 0.1 ersted, and uh, exhibit the uniaxial in plane isotropy, more likely related with the presence of the surface steps on the, so, of the substrate. And after the cobalt deposition, uh, the magnetic anisotropy is still pre pre present, and the direction of the easy axis is the same, but the loop width is increased in more than two orders of magnitude. So it's about 20 nanometers for structure with four nanometers of cobalt on top of on it. Uh, to, to distinguish these, uh, 
what is the reason of such behavior. We grew the sample with the thin gallium gadolinium gallium garnet spacer between the ferro magnet and fer yttrium iron garnet. So if you look at a Moog response, you can see this strange shaped loop, which can be explained if we suggest what the sign of magnetic optical response from the cobalt is opposite to the sign of the magnetic, magnetic optical response from the garnet. So here we have superposition of thin loop of net and thick loop of uh, cobalt, but with different signs. So it means that in this case, uh, the, these films are not coupled with each other as in, in, in pre comparing with the previous sample. And if you have a look for the minor magnetization curves, which can be filled, you can see what you can measure the minor loop in direction opposite to the magnetization of the transition metal layer. So it means the garden film, it is a kind of orange peel coupling. So the, it fills the magnetic field 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 on the roughness from the stray fields on the roughness of the ferromagnetic layer, which bias the, get the, the, the picture in more detail. We use the element selective, element selective met. We use the element selective, element selective met. We use the element selective, element selective met. These methods allow us to distinguish the magnetic this methods allows us to distinguish the magnetic. This methods allows us to distinguish the magnetic. This methods allows us to distinguish the magnetization of transition metal and garnet to uh, measure magnetization of garnet and transition metal separately. So, the, the idea of uh, XMCD method is to measure the absorption absorption signal for different or for opposite orientation of uh, helicity of incidence uh, uh, X-ray light to the sample magnetization. So you measure the absorption co coefficient for uh, different orientation of magnetization and helicity. And this is the um, XMTD signal. So Uh, he, here you can see the L, the, the storage for different orientation of sample magnetization. And this is the difference signal, namely XNCD signal. Two broad absorption peaks related with the transition. Two broad absorption peaks related with the transition. Two broad absorption peaks related with the transition. Two broad absorption peaks related with the transitions from the spin orbit split to P levels. And here you can see the absorption signal measured at iron edge uh, before and after cobalt deposition. Or before and after cobalt deposition. And here you can see the two XMCD signals measured at iron edge before and after cobalt de deposition. It is clear what the XMCD line shape has changed after the cobalt deposition. Uh, and if you measure the dependence of the absorption uh, XMCG signal from the applied magnetic field, you can measure the XMCG signals proportional to the magnetization of this chemical element. So if you measure the dependence of XMCG signal from the applied magnetic field, you can get the element selective magnetization curves for both uh, cobalt and iron atoms in the structure. So, 
element selective magnetization curves were obtained. As you can see, the loop width for uh, element selective loops measured at cobalt and iron edges are the same, and, it, and the line shape and, and the loop shape is also the same. It means that the magnetization reversal occurs simultaneously in both layers, in both cobalt and iron garnet layers. Um, we can uh, s suggest that these layers are exchange couplet with each other, and cobalt iron garnet magnetization are oriented in one direction. Here you can, can see the, so depending of the angle of the incidence, this, so depending of the angle of the incidence, this is the sample, and this is the electromagnet, we can also can measure the uh, out-of-plane magnetization curves. And in case of out-of-plane geometry, uh, we cannot, we, we not observe the saturation of XMCG signal even in, max, in maximum avail, available magnetic fields in contrast to uterine iron garnet. Uh, garnet. So here uh, you can see the magnetization curves measured by Moog, polar Moog technique. So you measure the normal component of magnetization of the sample, and you can see the full, fully saturated magnetization curve, which corresponds to saturation of a garnet. So in, contra in contrast to the in-plane geometry, there the two films are coupled and magnetization occurs simultaneously. Uh, is, is broken. So uterium garnet is saturated and cobalt, so uterium garnet is saturated and cobalt not yet. This, is, this occurs to the, due to the difference in the, in the, the demagnetization fields of the garnet and cobalt. So it means that in contrast to in-plane geometry, uh, in-plane magnetic anisotropy of garnet layer is not enhanced due to exchange interaction with the cobalt layer. And here on, on the last slide, I want to present the uh, preliminary uh, data obtained by ferromagnetic res resonance technique, uh, which, shows, which shows us the angular dependence of the fMR absorption. So, first of all, in case in of uh, when, when the magnetic field is applied in plane, and you change the azimuth, azimuthal orientation of the magnetic field in plane of the sample, there is no any axial anisotropy was was observed. Um, also, you can see that fine structure of absorption in case of in-plane geometry, which can be related with different resonance, resonant mode responsible for uh, absorption of, this, of both these layers. Uh, and in case of out-of-plane geometry, then you rot rotate the sample uh, in such a way with the magnetic field in the resonator of the fMR apparatus applied to the perpendicular to the surface plane. Uh, you have such uh, type of magnetization in sample. So in this case, uh, in my opinion, uh, these layers are not exchange couplet with each other, and the absorption should occur, absorption of uh, ferromagnetic resonance absorption should occur in both layers separately. So you can see different peaks. Mm. So this is it. So the main conclusions is uh, the magnetic properties of garnet can be tailored by exchange coupling with the transition metal overlay, over layer. For example, the fertility field uh, can be increased in more than two orders of magnitude. And uh, it means that the main structure of garnet film also can be tailored by exchange coupling. And that's it. So I want to thank you for your attention and uh, welcome you to, to visit our
poster sessions, poster sessions uh, to see the poster posters of our group uh, devoted to the iron cobalt baron layers. So let's see it. Uh, I think we have a time for the one question, and then we can continue discussion with the coffee. Okay. Questions, please. Okay, probably I get one short question about, about the saturation of the shift of the uh, of the loop. Uh, is there any saturation with the magnetic field of this loop? Saturation of the shift with the mag external magnetic field. Mm -hmm. so, you mean saturation of yes, the shift, yes, so yes. the dependence of the, of the shift from the applied field. Uh, we, did, we did not measure it yet, 